Professor Dana Anderson is the CTO and co-founder of Cold Quanta. If that wasn't challenging enough, he is a fellow of the Optical Society of America, American Physical Society, and Julia Institute. He is a professor in the departments of physics, electrical and computer engineering, and the director of the Quantum Applied Science and Engineering at University of Colorado Boulder. Since 1993, he has been involved in guiding and manipulating cold and ultra-cold atoms. He and his collaborators, Professor Carl Weinman and Dr. Eric Cornell, the 2001 Nobel laureates in physics, first demonstrated guiding of cold atoms through hollow core optical fibers in the mid-1990s. Dana and Dr. Cornell performed many of the earliest works guiding cold atoms on an atom chip, including the first demonstration of a chip-based atom, Michelson interferometer. Professor Anderson's group demonstrated the first ultra-cold atom chip portable vacuum system in 2004 and has been heavily involved in DOD-funded activities to develop ultra-cold atom chip systems. Given all that he is involved in, I asked Dana what he does to relax. He said he loves to fly. He has flown from the Alaskan Panhandle to far eastern Canada and everywhere in between. And when he needs to get away from it all, he takes to the air in his Cirrus SR-22. We are glad he is here with us today. I present to you Dana Anderson. Thank you, Diane. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to the second in a series of Cold Quanta's webinars on quantum technology. Cold Quanta was founded in 2007, and I'd like to take a moment to uh, thank and acknowledge the University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, and in particular, the Gila Institute, uh, the Department of Physics, and the Department of Electro Electrical Engineering for being incredibly supportive of Coquana's mission to develop, commercialize, and get quantum technology into the hands of the public and to companies. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work there. Uh, indeed, most of the, uh, much of the science that's behind the technology you'll be hearing about today came out of the university and also out of the National Institute uh, of Standards and Technology, which is just down the street here in Boulder. So welcome. Uh, Quantum is uh, much more visible these days than it was uh, 10 and 20 years ago, largely because of the growing interest uh, in quantum computing that's very much in the public eye. From our view, uh, quantum is not just about computing. Computing is a very important application of quantum technology, but from our point of view, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There are in fact many, many other applications that will benefit from the enabling aspects of quantum technology. And some quantum technologies are likely to replace existing, sometimes digital products. So, so in this picture of, of the iceberg, there's the computing that uh, many, many people see and is very visible, but also timekeeping and quantum positioning and signal processing communications. Some things not listed here like bioimaging, other applications are uh, in the making. And of course, there are going to be a slew of applications we can't even dream about today, uh, the same way as we saw in the rise after the laser of te the telecom industry, for example, who could have envisioned that after the laser was invented, um, or the fact that one can do eye surgery with a laser now as a routine basis. So more is yet to come that we can't picture but let me try to give you a picture of quant where quantum technology stands when it's based on, in particular, atoms. So uh, an outline of today's presentation, you could consider a tale of cold atoms along with laser light together working towards quantum technology. So I'll be talking about quantum and the extraordinary sensitivity of atoms to light and you'll get to see a picture of what I consider humankind's most quantum thing as of today. I'm going to tell you why quantum also means cool, uh, about the particle nature of things and the wave nature of things and the fact that you can't separate the two. And then I'm going to tell you how about how we go about getting atoms cold 
using lasers. And then sprinkled throughout my presentation is making good use of quantum through a variety of applications and technologies. I want to, want to tell you how, about we, how we go about getting even deeper into quantum, nearly to zero of absolute Kelvin temperature uh, through ultra cold matter, and even colder still, uh, having applications everywhere from clocks to sensors and to computers. So let's begin with uh, our concept of the atom as being a, a nucleus surrounded by uh, revolving electrons. And these nature given uh, entities are incredibly color selective or frequency -like selective of what kind of light you shine on them. So they'll respond very specifically to, to colors of light. And if you shine onto an atom, uh, the wrong frequency, the wrong color of light, with quotes around wrong, uh, not much happens. But if instead you shine on resonant light, the atom will act very strongly because electrons in the atom will make transitions when you shine in the right color of light. So very active. And ultimately, it's this incredible selectivity that gives atoms their utility in quantum technology. And the beautiful thing is, we like to refer to as the quantum certainty principle. As far as we know, every atom of a given isotope, in a few specifics, is like every other one uh, that's its clone. All the frequency selectivity will be there. All aspects will be identical for identical class of atoms. So they're very, very picky, if you like to say it that way, uh, about the color of light that you shine on them. And I'm going to tell you about two atoms that we use a lot. One is rubidium. Uh, rubidium is on the left side of the left first column of the periodic table. And it's useful because first of all, it's a very easy material. It's a metal, very easy to work with, uh, to make things happen, to make it useful. We combine it with lasers that are quite inexpensive, not unlike the ones out of a CD player. Low power laser diode technology, it can be made small, it's not too expensive. And so we view it as more or less the silicon of sensors and information processing, pretty easy to work with. So here is uh, a rubidium atom, it's isotope 87 for those of you that care. And its color of light is labeled by its frequency. It is in the near infrared part of the uh, optical spectrum. Some of you could see the light that li rubidium likes if it was uh, shining out of a laser. And to scale you for how sensitive it is, I have its frequency here written down to, oh, let's count. 3.84 such and such is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth and ninth significant figures are highlighted in yellow. And so if I shine light, uh, and change those last two significant figures, look what happens. I shine on the light at the frequency I've written. It's not quite right for rubidium to get excited about. But if I change that frequency just a little bit, all those significant figures deeply into the color, it begins to respond. And just dial it in a little bit more carefully. So I've now changed just the last two digits by a little, a little bit. It reacts very strongly. And it's this selectivity which makes rubidium so powerful in quantum uh, applications, as you'll soon see. Strontium is useful because it has incredibly uh, selective frequency characteristics. And it is used in what are currently the world's most accurate clocks, as an example. So here's a strontium isotope 88. Uh, and here's the frequency it would like to see. Uh, and look how many significant figures this frequency of light, the color, is in the deep red. And count the number of significant figures before I've highlighted the last two. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. So the number of significant figures is how precise the strontium atom cares about the light. And if I shine light on it with these last two significant figures with a one and zero, not much happens. 
but change them by a little bit, it'll begin to respond. Change by a little bit more, it responds very strongly. But it is this precision which makes the quantumness of these kinds of atoms so terribly useful in doing everything from making a clock to making a computer to making a gyroscope, for example, again, as you'll see. In fact, there's a lot of useful atoms in the periodic table, cesium, potassium, ytterbium, mercury, barium, and the physics community likes to make its way through the periodic table for a variety of reasons. Uh, so we have a long way to go, but even where we stand today with just a handful of them, we can do an incredible number of useful things. So let's give a very trivial and simple example of an application. Let's start with an atom and we'll put it in a vacuum chamber. So our atom today is green. Uh, and let's let it fall. Of course, the atom will, will fall. It will accelerate under gravity like anything else would, especially if it's in a vacuum so there's nothing to slow it down like air. But now let's shine a resonant laser beam on the atom. So it likes that color and it, you know, reacts strongly somehow. It'll absorb that light. But now let's let the atom fall under gravity again. What happens? Well, as it starts to accelerate, it stops absorbing. Now, some of these animations don't work that well, depending on your bandwidth. But if you could see it, the atom stopped responding. And that's because the atom is listening to Mr. Doppler, who says that uh, as the atom accelerates towards the source, the color of the laser looks uh, different. It looks bluer, as a matter of fact. And if the laser were instead coming from above, down, uh, the atom would see the laser become redder and redder uh, from its point of view. In either case, the laser becomes detuned from what the atoms like to see and it stops absorbing the light because of this Doppler shift. And just to remind you, that Doppler shift is the same thing that causes the sound of an approaching ambulance to be high frequency and then it goes by and recedes, goes to low frequency. It's the same with lasers. And we just refer to the high frequency as becoming bluer, the lower frequency becoming redder from the atom's point of view. So already I've made something that measures gravity or made an accelerometer. Now, in fact, there are much better ways to make an accelerometer or a, a gravity sensor, and that's based on matter waves. But I wanted to give you at least one instance where the selectivity had already an apparently useful function. Well, the problem is, or the issue is, of course, uh, uh, is turn that around is the atoms uh, that we normally have are moving pretty fast. This picture, which you might have seen if you listened to our CEO's talk a few weeks ago, is a picture of a vacuum or the core part of a vacuum cell that Cole Quantum manufactures, where it gets very high vacuum inside when it's sealed off. And it's made of glass so we can shine lasers on the atoms that are inside. But to begin with, the atoms are going very fast. In fact, in the room you're sitting in, the atoms are going something like, oh, 650 miles per hour or 300 meters per second. They're just, you know, flying around like, a, like gangbusters. And again, this movie does not show up too well in uh, depending on your bandwidth, but it's uh, what we can imagine the atoms do, not to mention the dust that's probably in the room, but not in the vacuum cell. They're moving very fast. And so if you're thinking of shining very selective laser light, the atoms that are moving aren't gonna see it if you don't do things right. And the same is true for the atoms in the glass cell when we start out with them, whether it's rubidium or strontium or what. So for most quantum applications, this 650 miles per hour is just way too fast. So slowing the atoms down means to cool them. So let me talk about cold quanta. Maybe you can understand how it got its name. 
because when it comes to atoms, cold is the same as slow, is the same as matter waves, and that's all about quantum. And that goes all the way back uh, to 1929, where Louis de Broglie was awarded the 1929 Nobel Prize for his discovery of the wave nature of particles. And that discovery is articulated in terms of a pretty simple equation, lambda equals h over m times v, where lambda is the wavelength. h is a very important uh, constant, but just a constant, which signifies that something is quantum. So it's called Planck's constant. Divided by the mass, divided by the velocity of a particle. So the heavier a particle is, the longer its wavelength. The fast, the slower it moves, the longer its wavelength. And I would just like to scale you a bit onto what we're talking about to make it a little more accessible. So I have a chart here for rubidium 87. And the top, uh, the top row is labeled T for temperature in Kelvin, uh, lambda for the wavelength, V for the velocity, and the time, T, is the time it would take for an atom at that temperature T to move across the back of your living room. In reality, it's 10 meters. And if you have a, if you don't live in an apartment and have a house, maybe your living room is 10 meters across. So at 300 Kelvin, that's about room temperature, the wavelength of an atom is smaller than the size we used to, we usually think of an atom. It's 0 0.02 nanometers. It's going, as we've already said, about 300 meters per second. And it would take three hundredths of a second to cross the back of your room. At one Kelvin, so the whole universe is at three Kelvin. So this is colder already than the universe. The wavelength of a rubidium atom would be about 0.3 nanometers. That's the size of a very small molecule like water, for example. Uh, it has a velocity of about 20 meters per second. And it would take two tenths of a second to cross the back of the room. At a temperature of a millikelvin, that's about 10 times colder than superconductors typically operate at. The wavelength is nine nanometers. That's the size of a medium molecule. Its velocity is about half a meter per second. You can run that fast. And at time take to cross the back room is six seconds. At a micro Kelvin, the wavelength of an atom, of a rubidium atom, is approaching the wavelength of light. It propagates at two centimeters per second, and it would take two minutes to cross the back of your living room. And at a nano Kelvin, the wavelength of an atom is nine nanometers, that's nine microns. That's about a tenth of the diameter of, a, of your hair on your head. And the velocity is about half a millimeter per second. It would take an hour and a half to cross the back of your living room. So we use lasers to cool atoms, very non-intuitive. Non we use them to cool them along with magnetic fields and radio frequency fields to cool atoms to near absolute zero, to trap them against gravity, and to manipulate and otherwise control the behavior of atoms. So it's all about laser cooling. And what I told you a little earlier is not uh, quite right. Uh, it was not the whole picture of shining a laser on an atom. When you shine a laser on an atom and it absorbs a photon from the laser, the atom recoils, it gets a kick. So imagine the atom, green atom on the lower left-hand side of your screen. We shine a laser from left that's going from left to right. The atom absorbs and it gets a little kick and the atom will keep moving at constant velocity thereafter. Of course, it would fall if it was under gravity. If we shine on the laser beam for longer, the atom will absorb more and move faster. So this idea was cultivated by uh, three scientists, that we, by many scientists, but the three that were recognized for their seminal contributions were awarded the 1997 Nobel Prize 
for the development of methods to cool and trap atoms with laser light. And those people included Stephen Chu, former Secretary of Energy, Claude Contenuji from the École Normale Supérieure, and William Phillips from NIST uh, and the University of Maryland uh, in Gaithersburg, Maryland. So they, they said, well, let's send one laser to the left, from the left to the right, and let's send another laser beam from the right to the left. And we're not going to tune this laser to be resonant with the atoms. Instead, we're going to tune it to be below the frequency the atoms care about, and we say to the red of atomic resonance. Now imagine that an atom is moving from left and from right to left. Well, then it will see the Doppler shifted laser beam coming from left to right and be in resonance. And it will recoil as it absorbs and eventually stop and no longer be able to absorb that light. If instead the atom was created and moving to the right, well, that atom would, would absorb the laser light coming from the right until it was moving slow enough it didn't see that laser light anymore and it would stop. Now, the details are a little finer than that. Uh, and in particular, you can't really get them to stop. But nevertheless, you can do a remarkable job of cooling atoms to very close to absolute zero. And if you think things are delicate, the force that the atoms see due to laser light is as much as about a thousand Gs. That's a thousand times the force of gravity. So one should not confuse the sensitivity of atoms to being delicate. We are holding them and causing them to do what we want with huge forces like mortars and bricks. And that's what makes the technology not only uh, incredible from a quantum point of view, but also practical because the forces we apply are large enough that everything doesn't have to be done in a very delicate laboratory. They can be out there in the real world doing useful things. And the fact is we can use this laser light to, to cool atoms in a very short distance. The cell you saw earlier was two centimeters across and we can stop atoms or slow them down in less, a less than a centimeter of distance. And this is very routine for us. Uh, the device to do this is called the magnetoaptic trap. It is a mainstay of many research laboratories and, and industries that want to uh, use atoms in interesting ways. So it's called the MOT, magneto-optic, optic because of the lasers, magneto because we also have magnetic fields to help uh, trap the atoms in a given place. So we'll immediately cool down rubidium to about 300 microkelvin. And so this picture that you've seen before on the starting um, slide uh, shows a artist rendering of one of Colquana's kinds of cells and you see six laser beams. There are three pairs of oppositely directed laser beams and that's enough to stop atoms moving in all directions. And an early picture of trying to make these things small is shown here. This came out of my lab many years ago. Uh, and has all the elements of the things that we use today. And you can take a snapshot of the atoms when they're cold. Uh, there you see a little cloud and that's about a billion or at least several hundred million atoms that we can literally take a picture of. And they're at 300 microkelvin. And today, uh, as I said, it's very standard technology. Uh, Colquana uh, has a commercial product that's a kit for research labs and educational institutions that want to study cold atoms. and and customers, uh, we can make very small handheld size vacuum systems. This is the core part of a sensor to, in fact, uh, measure gravity. The upper right picture. So laser cooling is, in fact, just a starting point for much of atom-based quantum technology. And we will take you from being cold to be, to be very cold and to ultra cold. And I use the term ultra cold to mean when temperature is no longer meaningful. And instead, you replace the laws of thermodynamics with the laws of quantum mechanics to understand what's going on. And the achievement of ultra cold matter in a gas was first, was first made 
by colleagues of mine here at the University of Colorado and at uh, MIT, Eric Cornell, Wolfgang Ketterle, and Carl Wyman. And they received the 2001 Nobel Prize for this achievement of cooling a gas of atoms to very low temperatures and turning them into a pure quantum state. And what you see in the lower right is a very famous triplet of snapshots, literally pictures taken of cold atoms, ultra cold atoms, false color though. Uh, and on the left, or excuse me, on the lower right, you'll see the temperatures, 400 nanokelvin, 200 nanokelvin, and 50 nanokelvin, where a nanokelvin is a billionth of a degree of absolute zero. And in the three pictures, you see at first on the left, this sort of mound of atoms. They are still properly described by thermodynamics. And those atoms are being held in something like a magnetic bowl uh, to keep them in one place. And as the atoms are cooled, suddenly there's this spire that sticks out of the broad base. And that spire is the signature of a quantum wave function that all the atoms have together formed in the same single quantum wave function. And at low enough temperatures, there's practically no thermal background left in its pure quantum mechanical state. In fact, there are many forms of ultra cold matter. Bose Einstein condensate is one of them and the first that was demonstrated, but there are also Fermi gases, atoms in optical lattices, which I'll talk about, and even the quantum computer qubits when they're made of atoms or ions, it's just a form, if you like, a very special and useful form of ultra cold matter. So you hear more about cold quantum BEC systems and related uh, topics in our next uh, webinar given by Dr. Seth Calico. So just to show you a progression of where things started well more than 20 years ago, in fact, uh, the 25th anniversary for BEC uh, is coming up uh, this year. Uh, this is Wolfgang Ketterle's BEC machine photograph. This table that that mess of stuff is standing on, it's a very organized, but it looks messy. Uh, it's about four feet by six feet of optics and lasers and vacuum systems and mirrors and special optic things and pumps and so on, plus racks of electronics that you don't see. In about 2013, and thanks to some previous work by the University of Colorado, Coquana commercialized this ultra cold matter machine. This is a 2013 version with Coquana folks marveling over the laser system that sits inside of that drawer. And now that technology, uh, we're very proud to say, is off in space, uh, operating on the International Space Station. Uh, there was the most recent launch of Colquana's second system this past December. Uh, on the upper right, you'll see astronaut Christina Koch installed the newly arrived second BEC machine, cold matter machine, on the International Space Station, which before that had already been uh, producing ultra cold matter in space for about 18 months uh, every day, as far as we know, continuously. And uh, as I said, it was a very proud achievement to be part of this mission. And the lower left photo is uh, uh, myself and Eric Cornell, who had the honor of attending the rocket launch, uh, which was uh, an exciting uh, experience. So uh, when I used to give talks around the country, when one could travel about what Quanta does, <coughs> um, I realized that I forgot to point out some really key features of atom technology compared to other technologies, uh, just from a, from a standpoint of sending it up in space, in any case. Here's a photograph of uh, the superconducting quantum computer at IBM and Google. And you see this complicated chandelier structure and spaghetti cabling. Uh, that's because they too have to operate cold. Uh, they operated about 15 millikelvin using liquid helium. And so all of this complexity is because they need to keep the superconductors cold. Uh, and uh, they do so with refrigerators. And they're called refrigerators called cryostats. Uh, and it's hard to imagine putting that into space. 
Starting with the artist's conception of a cold quantum cell, note that only the atoms themselves are cold. If I do a little schematic here showing a, a version of the cell, we're talking about a cell that's about two centimeters across. Uh, it's topped by an atom chip, which is less than a millimeter thick. Uh, the glass is an anti-vacuum cell. Uh, the pressure on the outside down here on Earth is about an atmosphere. Inside, it's about a nanotor. And the chip, of course, is at 300 Kelvin, as is the rest of the cell. And we make, when we make a cloud of ultra-cold matter, the atoms are at about 100 nanokelvin. Only two widths of your hair from the surface of the chip. And to this day, I still marvel at that, that uh, you have a 100 nanokelvin cloud of atoms, 200 microns from the chip, that's at room temperature. And we couldn't do that if the atoms were not so very selective about the frequencies and wavelengths they're willing to play with. And so, again, only the atoms are cold, and they're incredibly cold, and everything else can be hot. And that means you can launch these things in a rocket, realistically, because they're small, they're compact, and they don't mind the forces uh, that they'll experience in use aboard the space station, for example. So we've talked about the cooling forces on atoms. Uh, and in that case, we use laser light that is resonant or nearly resonant, just tuned to the red of uh, the light the atoms like to see. But we can also use light to impose forces on atoms, even when the light frequency is far from resonance. So although it didn't look like much happened, there is indeed something that happens when you shine light on an atom, even though it doesn't absorb the light. So we can apply forces with this non-resonant light, and we refer to these forces as conservative uh, in the same sense that the force of a spring pushing on a mass is conservative. If you started oscillating, for example, it would go like that forever, uh, ideally in vacuum and no friction, et cetera, et cetera. So these are conservative forces, and we use this to do optical trapping. So imagine this is meant to be a red detuned laser beam. Particles, off-resonant off particles, so the beam is far detuned to the red, the particles will be attracted to the high-intensity areas of that beam, and that's how Eric and I did guiding years ago of atoms and light beams, because the atoms are attracted. Alternatively, if you turn a laser beam to the blue of its atomic resonance, it acts as a barrier. And so you can reflect atoms or keep atoms out of an area. And these two forces turn out to be incredibly useful tools in quantum atomics. And these forces, as I said before, they can be also very large, 10 to hundreds of Gs. Uh, that is 10 to 100 times the force of gravity. So let's talk about holding atoms up against gravity, because after all, if you want to do work on them here on Earth, uh, you don't want them to fall. So if we take a pair of laser beams, one from up to, up to top to bottom and the other one from bottom to top, they will form an interference pattern, a series of light and dark regions. They're very closely spaced, unlike the picture here, very closely spaced, but nevertheless, a, a collection of light and dark patterns, they would look like pancakes going in and out of the board if the laser beams were circular. And if I detune them to red of a strontium atom resonance or a rubidium atom re resonance, I can trap the atoms against gravity. They'll be attracted to the high intensity regions and hold them up in a vacuum system and they won't fall. And in fact, if I combine this idea in two or three dimensions, I can make a two or three uh, dimensional pattern, and we refer to this as an optical lattice. So in this case on the left, I have two pairs of oppo oppositely directed laser beams, top to bottom and left to right, and I get a perfectly periodic array of light and dark regions. And I can populate them with atoms to likewise make a perfect periodic array of atoms. And this is used in 
the atomic physics community and in the condensed matter community to simulate materials because these atoms and lattices can emulate what electrons do in perfect crystals. And the beauty is here, there are no defects unless I want them. Whereas when you, manu when you make a crystal, there's always some defect, always some dirt. So these are being used in material science studies. And we refer to this as quantum emulation, which complements quantum simulation that folks would like to do with quantum computers. The difference being that this is a real physical system that's tailored to act like another one. So let me give you an example of an application that uses optical lattices, and it brings us to what I call humankind's most quantum thing. Uh, and this thing is a clock. And the clock in the labs down the street from me at both the university and at NIST, they lose about a second in the entire age of the universe. So technically a few parts in 10 to the 19th instability, as they like to call it. And, and at the university is a clock called an optical lattice clock. And it's made by three sets of interfering laser beams to make this perfectly periodic potential. So it looks like a cube and an atom ideally is in every uh, high intensity region and held up against gravity. And in fact, this clock is very much like a lot of systems that Cole Quanta builds. Uh, from quantum computers to clocks that uses lasers in a variety of ways. We first use the lasers to cool the atoms. We use a different set of lasers to trap the atoms, like in this cube, and a different set still to interrogate or program the, the um, atoms. Here we're interrogating to find out what time it is, for example. And this uses quantum entanglement and it's so accurate that if you lift it up by 20 centimeters, it ticks at a different rate. And in fact, why is timekeeping interesting? Well, uh, it's interesting because an entire inertial measurement unit can be constructed of a clock alone. And if you looked at clock technology um, and if you cared about it, uh, here's what's interesting. In this graph, don't worry about the graph, it's just down is good. And up here, is the clock that tells you what time it is. This tells the world time. When you look at your watch, your time is traceable to this time kept down the street at NIST with a cesium clock and similar clocks around the world. And the quantum clock is about a factor of a thousand higher performance than uh, the world timekeeper. So the optical lattice clock uses ultra cold atoms being held at the laser light. And, and we can do the same in a quantum computer where we hold atoms in place, not the same way, but in a periodic pattern where each atom is held by its own laser beam. We can shine on laser light to change the atom from one state, we call zero to another state one and back again. Or we can put it in a superposition state and that is uh, the key to power of quantum computing. One of the keys is that I can make a zero and a one, not just a zero or a one. And in fact, I can do that with an entire array of atoms, put them in various states, and then I can have them talk to each other to carry out quantum logic. So it's the same stuff that goes into the clock as goes into the quantum computer and goes into many quantum applications uh, is that these atoms, their credible selectivity, lasers to cool, trap, and manipulate the atoms. Let me give you a, a very different application, and that's as a radio receiver. And I'm going to go through this very quickly. Don't worry about um, the details. The key here is that we use atoms in what is called the Rydberg state, both in quantum computing and to detect RF at 100 gigahertz. Your phone uses RF gigahertz. And this was done in 1980. And in 1980, cooling atoms with lasers was not something that people could do routinely. 
And in those days, the performance of the detector of RF was is uh, given here. Uh, this is incredibly good performance. Don't worry about the number, except remember it's 10 to the minus 19. And here's a paper from March 2020 of the state of the art of conventional detectors that were going to space based on superconductors. And the date is March uh, of 2010. And they achieved at 97 gigahertz, so almost 100, uh, three times 10 to the minus 17 in this performance number. And so in 30 years, the 1980 paper still had a factor of 100 times better performance. But we didn't know how to use it practically because we still needed a refrigerator in those days to cool the atoms. So think of this. If I use these Bose condensate ultra-cold atoms, here they are in reverse from 50 to 500 nanocalvin, should be 400, that's a mistake, that if I'm able to properly couple them, and that's some magic of Rydberg, to radio frequencies, one radio frequency photon has enough energy to melt an entire cloud of ultra cold matter atoms. The key is how do I couple them? Because if it wasn't for the selectivity of the atoms, I could never make this quantum matter. And now if I get clever about how I get them to talk to RF, they make incredible detectors of RF. And that's what's happened from 1980 to now. So Coke Quanta basically, as I've tried to say, uses the same, same tool sets and the same ideas for everything, whether it's about quantum computing, shown here, whether it's to make a gyroscope, for example, shown here. Here, atoms are forced to go around in a circle, uh, which makes them a gyroscope, not unlike uh, the gyroscope you played with as a kid, possibly played with as a kid. Uh, make atoms go in a circle, they become sensitive to rotation. And also, we do something called um, signal processing with painted potentials, uh, circuits, if you like, of light uh, painted by very fast moving laser beams, unlike the simulation here, animation, uh, where the circuit stuff is carried out by atoms rather than electrons. And it's in the middle of a vacuum system instead of on some substrate. So I've told you about cold quantum core. It's these ingredients of cooling atoms, trapping them and manipulate them. What would you like to ask about them? Is it about ultra cold matter, quantum networking, signal processing, machine learning, quantum wave functions? <coughs> We'd like to know what you'd like to hear about. So please let us know. Uh, and I hope that you've gotten some perspective on uh, the things we like to think about. And we very much welcome your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dana. So we do have a few questions. Um, let me pull these up here. What are the advantages and disadvantages of trapping charged ions versus neutral atoms? Uh, that's an awfully good question. You know, we, uh, we view atoms and ions as close cousins of each other. Um, and if you looked at clock technology, you would see that they're constantly neck and neck with their performance. Uh, and uh, they, uh, ions, whether using ions or atoms, they, they both require laser cooling. Um, and I think they simply have a different set of advantage. Ions, you can, you can trap very, very strongly. They can be made more robust. They have so far the highest performance logic gates of any uh, technology for making qubits. Uh, so you can get very high precision at, from them as quantum computers. Uh, neutral atoms, uh, so we believe, are far easy to scale to very large numbers without having to connect separate modules of the parts of quantum computer together. So we think we can scale to hundreds and thousands of qubits using neutrals, whereas uh, in ions, one scales uh, possibly with higher performing qubits to a lower number, and then you have to modularly tie them together. We, um, we are fans of both. Uh, Coquana's uh, effort is in neutrals, but we also do work uh, in ions uh, contributing to the community. 
And uh, so we see them on a rather equal plane from their viability in general, uh, uh, but we see certain niches for the neutrals of having a great strength and other niches for ions having great strength. Thank you. Others, Diane? Yes. Um, how can you ensure that there is only one atom trapped in each location? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, in the end, if, if we like, we can literally look. And when you hear a later talk on cold quantum, quantum computing, a later webinar, you can ask that question again, but you'll see a picture of the atoms. And we can know because uh, a, a site will behave completely differently if it has one atom or more than one atom. But there's some beautiful science tricks to pretty much guarantee that you only have one. And the words are, if you want to Google it, light assisted collisions and so on. So it's a very, very good question. It's non-trivial, but the techniques for doing it are by now pretty highly developed. Okay, and here's a BEC question. Um, I'd be interested to know how those BEC distributions are measured or constructed in an experiment. Thank you. Good. Uh, well, later this summer, by the way, we, uh, Colquata, hopes to make uh, BEC machines available to you so you can learn a little bit more about that. And you'll hear a lot about it from Seth uh, Kellogg at Dr. Kellogg's webinar coming up. But uh, we, once again, typically take a picture of them uh, and uh, measure the distribution. We also control their distribution by the way we make, or by the way we shine light on them. We use both red and blue detuned light. And once again, we can take uh, a picture and we usually anticipate a certain behavior. And therefore we start the system and look a little bit later to ensure that indeed our predictions are correct. The same thing happens by the way on the space station. Uh, almost all the work is done by taking pictures, uh, literally uh, of the atoms using laser light and a camera. Let's see. Would you say more about how the atoms are attracted toward the red um, detuned light? Um, yes, if I understand the question, so I say more about it. Um, the whys, um, and I'm not sure whether you're asking if it's the whys or, or the hows or the what. Um, so first the why, uh, roughly speaking. Um, an atom likes to be, depending on your background, the, the uh, I have one more thing I want to back up about it. By the way, it's incredibly interesting to know that a recent Nobel Prize was awarded to the fellow who first used light to trap not atoms, but particles, which uh, now is under heavy use in the health industry and studies of molecule, uh, biomolecules known in the techniques called optical tweezers. Uh, and he and Steve Chu were at Bell Labs at the same time, and I'm sure interacted so that they just diverged in what they did. In any case, if you take a capacitor as an example with two plates and put a little piece of transparent dielectric, it doesn't have to be transparent, dielectric material, it's attracted to the center of the plates because overall it lowers its energy, it feels a force. So if you're asking about the physics, that's a quick answer. Um, if you're asking about something else, I don't know, Diane, if you can refine the question a bit, I'd be glad to try to answer it. Um, well, that's all I see right now, so. <laughs> but the type of question will answer it. Yeah, we have a lot of questions coming in right now. They were, um, everybody was so fascinated with your presentation. I think, Dana, they were slow to ask questions and now they're firing them away. Um, are the quantum gates you expect to implement nearest neighbor or could separated qubits be made to interact? And what would be the fidelity of these operations? Oh, it's such a fantastic question. Uh, first of all, uh, the way our atoms interact, they're called Rid the Rydberg blockade, can act over quite a few neighbors. Uh, so there's nearest neighbor, if we roughly speaking it, this is the way Bo Ewald likes to say it, it, you think of the nearest neighbor, then the next nearest neighbor, then the next next nearest neighbor is perfectly reasonable for us to talk about. So many, and since we're dealing in a surface, that's a lot of qubits uh, that you can have acting on one gate. What's the fidelity? Um, 
uh, the fidelity initially is, uh, I would say the research is behind what the ions are able to do right now in the superconductors. So I can talk about the theoretical fidelity, which is about 0.9999, I should have about five nines in there. Uh, and there's recent experimental work at Caltech uh, to suggest that not long for now, we'll be seeing 9929s or 996, if I'm talking to somebody who understands those numbers. Uh, and for us, uh, this is a f very familiar problem in, in uh, I call it engineering as opposed to science. I think we'll get up to 0 .99, uh, above 0.99 soon and about 0.996 uh, in uh, not the distant future. And that's enough where we can start using quite a few qubits to do interesting things. Okay. Oh my goodness. Um, how are the cold atoms utilized for international sensing and navigation? Uh, wonderful question. Thank you. Um, so the uh, I showed you the simple example of dropping uh, a particle and it accelerating. The difference is that we use the atoms wave-like nature. And as a gyroscope, that's easier to describe, as a gyroscope, they work pretty much the same way as a fiber gyroscope. A fiber gyroscope sends two laser beams, uh, not laser beams, but optical beams in opposite direct. If you could see my hands, this would make it a lot easier, but you can't. So imagine making, taking a light beam and splitting it to two and wrapping it around a loop many times, and that loop is made of fiber. Uh, and uh, then after many round trips, you combine back those two light beams. And Adams, the cold quantum approach, is essentially the same. We take an atomic ensemble, we split its wave function, not the atom as in nuclear physics, but the atom wave function is like splitting the light beam. Uh, in two, and then we make the atoms go round and round in a loop and recombine them. Uh, and the fact that atoms have mass, whereas light does not, tends to make them far more sensitive for, for a given amount of time, far more sensitive than the light beams. But the truth in lending disclosure, it's hard to get a lot of atoms compared to a lot of photons. Uh, but the principles are uh, all the same for light and for atoms. In uh, accelerometers, uh, there aren't light basis accelerometers along the same as the, fiber, as the light gyroscopes, but in atoms there can be. You can split the atoms, uh, you can have them go far apart and back together again. And I'm glad if you ask a, a question, specialized webinar on it because it's such, such an important topic and it has a lot to do with a cold quantum's effort to develop um, quantum positioning systems to either replace or augment uh, with quantum, uh, the GPS with a more secure um, and less vulnerable uh, positioning system. So that's a very interesting topic and glad to speak well over an hour about it. <laughs> it's a little bit follow on to that. How would you apply this to global positioning system? Is it simply a more accurate accelerometer? Yeah, if you want to put simple in, in quotes, I mean, so the, the vision is uh, that GPS is most vulnerable uh, uh, part is the 30 satellites that are up there transmitting RF to receivers down here. So it's the satellites that make them vulnerable. If you want to remove that vulnerability, uh, you provide positioning systems more locally uh, to airplanes, to things that move, to underwater uh, surface ships. Uh, and of course, you always need an initial position, but after that, it's a matter of how well your quantum positioning system can uh, keep track of where it is without uh, an update. And that's where quantum strength is, just to making that time longer and longer compared to what existing technology can do. Uh, you also want it local um, so that uh, whatever happens, uh, the lights don't go out uh, uh, on your positioning system and that way it can also be more private. 
uh, right now everybody and the everybody can know roughly where you are and also uh, without much work make you think you're someplace you're not so you want to make it secure and unspoofable but again it's really a, a local system for doing that thank you for a good question Diane? yes um is it still possible to use atomic ensembles rather than single atoms as qubits uh it, it's almost a philosophical question the answer is absolutely yes um and uh you know the the uh clock is an ensemble all the atoms are entangled and uses this 3d lattice and they're not individually addressable atoms and in the signal processing that we think about it's often done with ensembles as opposed to single qubits and there's a whole field of study that that thinks about uh carrying out quantum information with ensembles and other kinds of states other than individual qubits as is usually thought about What is the time scale for which you expect quantum sensors to have a significant market? Oh, that's <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> you know, uh, Coquana was born uh, now 14 years ago, and we thought the quantum market was around the corner. And it's taken a little longer than we thought, but now s suddenly the world is very turned turned on to quantum. And, uh, and the US in particular and the UK and other governments are pushing very hard. I think the time to deployment uh, is actually not very far away. In many respects, you say atomic clocks, quantum clocks have always been out there, I mean, since the 50s. Um, and I think uh, the use of atomic sensors is not that far away. And if I seem kind of shy in answering the bottom line in terms of the number of years, is because it's changing so fast that uh, the, UN vet, the US is now investing very heavily. And the whole key is how fast, you know, typically it's going to be adopted for defense and security purposes yet. And, so, and it's really a question about market acquisition, how fast that can take place. I don't think it's a question of science. I think it's a, a question of uh, acquisition and then engineering. So I think the answer could be uh, in less than two years uh, uh, if people wanted to see it happen. Okay. Um, do you mitigate the crosstalk between qubits and the arrays via post analysis? <laughs> that's, that's a much, so I'd like to pretend I'm a, a, a quantum computing expert, but I'm not. Uh, and that will be a question better asked uh, uh, when we talk about quantum computing specifically. I think, um, uh, let, let me just leave it at that. <laughs> okay, can BEC be used as a replacement for radar, of radar? Oh, that's a lovely question. So there's, there's talk in the papers about quantum radar particularly, and so we have to be careful about our words. I am personally not that keen on quantum radar. But uh, a RF, a receiver based on atoms, can perform all the functions of radar, meaning it can do range, it can do uh, direction, it can do Doppler shift. Uh, it can serve all those functions that are replacing at hopefully high performance level what is currently done with classical receivers. So I want to distinguish the use of quantum in sort of a, a, a classical replacement uh, just at high performance versus quantum where we're using say entanglement with microwave photons. So the answer to the, that, that second one is, well, I'm, I'm uh, not a, a big, uh, I don't buy in big time in quantum radar in that context, but pretty big in the uh, replacing the typical electronic receiver with some uh, atom-based capability. I hope I answered your question. 
Thank you, Dana. <clears throat> and thank you everyone for sending in your questions. Um, we have hit 11 o'clock. There's still a number of unanswered questions, but our panelists will be working on getting those out. Um, so what we will do is make the um, questions and answers available along with the um, video. So thank you all again. Um, our next webinar um, we'll be sending out probably next week, which will be on BEC. So please look forward to that invitation. And everyone have a run wonderful rest of the week. Thank you, everybody.